the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born while shepherds keep their marching or silent flocks by night behold through the heavens there shone a holy light go tell it on the mountain Thank you. Thank you, Maribeth. What a great way to start our Sunday. Welcome. Welcome to St. Matthew's, whether you're here or with us at home. We're glad you're here. Amazing day here. It's sunny, it's warm, and we're ready to celebrate. As you might notice, we're decked out with the Christmas tree in Bethlehem. Advent begins today. So as we prepare for Christ's birth, let us worship today. Please stand and join us in the call to worship. The Lord be with you. And also the Lord is calling you and calling us all to fulfill our purpose in this life. Uh, please remain standing for the opening prayer, which is coming up. Here we go. Heavenly Father and Lord of all, teach us to prayerfully seek your plan. Teach us to see your glory in the eyes of your faithful. Teach us to hear your voice through your messengers. Teach us to say, let it be so according to your grace. Amen. Please join me in singing hymn number 196, Come Thou Long Expected. Jesus will sing both verses. Come thou long expected Jesus born to serve thy peace. Good morning, everyone. This is the first Sunday of the Christian year. It is the first Sunday of what was celebrated many, many years before we adopted the Roman calendar as being sort of the mark of the beginning of our relationship with Jesus Christ in worship throughout the year. So although uh, we got things aligned differently, you know, in terms of the first of the year being January and all sorts of things about 12 kind of took over. Uh, we had this calendar that actually flowed uh, on the church's basis in the first century that seemed to make a lot of sense. And Advent was the very beginning of all that. I'd like the Inouye family to come and join us up here today. I believe we've got a mic here that 
should work for you. And uh, there you go. And the first candle of Advent, as that became a tradition in the second, third century, was trying to remind us that we are to anticipate the birth of Christ. So they took this time of getting ready, and then we somehow squeezed that into, horseshoed it into this uh, different calendar, but that got down to four different Sundays that would take us toward Advent into Christmas. Advent meaning expectation. The first candle is the candle of hope, and the Inouye's are going to share with us what that means today and light the first candle for us. So. We light this first Advent candle on the first Sunday of Advent. It is the candle of hope. It reminds us that the Lord has promised hope to all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as Mary believed in the promises of God when she delivered the Messiah into this world, we can believe in those same promises. Just as our community needs hope in these days of COVID, we can offer the hope of healing in Jesus Christ our Lord. Mary found her hope in the Lord Jesus, so will we. Today is the first day of Advent. Isn't that exciting? It might be if I knew what Advent is. <laughs> it means Christmas is coming, time to prepare for Jesus' birthday. Now that is exciting. Yes, Jesus, Son of God, born of Mary. Can you imagine what it was like to be Mary, Jesus' mother? I mean, an actual angel came to her and told her she was going to have a baby that would be God's son. That sounds very scary to me. I would be like, why me? Are you sure? I don't even have insurance. <laughs> well, she was scared and she did have questions, but in the end, she just said, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Wow, I'm not sure I could do that. Do you think that God would ask you to do something that you couldn't do? Don't you believe that with God, all things are possible? I guess what I'm saying is that even though all things are possible with God, there are a lot of things I wouldn't want to do and just as soon not be asked. The problem with us humans is that we don't always see the big picture. Wait a minute. Don't start making fun of the size of my TV. <laughs> no, what I mean is God's plans are often much bigger than we can even imagine. Sometimes we just have to say yes to God and trust in his plan. If Mary knew God's plan for Jesus ahead of time, she would have really been scared. I'm sure glad she had enough faith in God to say yes. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel, Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38. <clears throat> In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was great what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? 
The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. God's word for his people. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Pierre, what a blessing. I could just sit there all day and listen to you play. I know that uh, a lot of shifting is going on around the world, a lot of things happening that we didn't anticipate, expect. We didn't expect to lose our sister Judy so quickly either. And Marv, I'm so glad that you're with us here today. And I, I know this is tough to be here, but we are, we are with you. And we'll stand with you all the days to come. Marv wanted to make sure that we had a celebration of Judy's life already beginning here, and so these yellow roses are up on the altar for her today, and we thank you for that gift to us. But we return our gift back to you. We're going to be celebrating her life uh, in a memorial here at the church on the 21st of December. And... Um, I think it's time is three o'clock, but uh, make sure you check everything that comes out between now and then uh, as we move forward with this. It's kind of the way life works, isn't it? You make your plans and then things happen and then we say, God, whoa, that wasn't on my calendar. <laughs> if Mary had had her cell phone with her that day when the angel showed up and said, Nine months from now, you're going to give birth to the Son of God. She would have said, I, I never got that text. I never got that. Let me check Instagram. Oh, wait a minute. How about, how about Twitter? Uh, let me go over here to, maybe it's over on TikTok. I mean, there's got to be something that tells people ahead of time what in the heck's going to happen in our life. Wouldn't it be nice to know ahead of time? And yet, if, as the puppets shared with us today, if we knew ahead of time, most of us would volunteer not to do this thing called life, right? Just let's skip from being born, believing in you, Lord, and going on into the banquet and having a time together, right? But the people in my life, and probably in yours, that inspire me the most are the ones that face those things. And not only do they face them well, but they, they move through them with a very human reaction, but then on the other side of that, we see that they were faithful in that journey. And quite frankly, if people weren't faithful in their journey, you and I would not be sitting here today. There would be no such thing as the church of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Because the first century was not a time to be starting some new religion where just 
speaking a name higher than Caesar at the time was for sure destruction of your lifestyle, if not death itself. So if we really see the first church and everything that happened around this whole miracle of the birth of Jesus coming as a human and as God, if we really understood how difficult that was for people to make happen and had followed through with this, even though they weren't sure and none of this made a lot of sense, the church would not have been born. Christ would have come and gone without any recognition. And the disciples would have all run for their lives and never started the church. You know, each of the 12 disciples, including the one who took his own life and then the one who was brought in when they cast lots for the new guy, all of them died, not from old age. Beheadings, quartered by horses, put on stakes, crucified upside down. None of them, as far as we know, made it past the age of 50. And none of their families had any sort of comfort, pension, or support. And the church wasn't organized at that time enough to be able to supply the needs that people had, although they made a great attempt. We even know in the very first days of the church after Pentecost that they all took every resource they had, they divided them up so nobody had a need. But as they spread out through Asia Minor and into the West and tr some attempt to get into the East, they ran into one obstacle after another. And we've been sharing a lot of stories about Paul and about the church at Corinth and Ephesus and all these places where the church was really struggling. But they were struggling because they were, they were faithful. They, they had difficulty in their life because they were living life as it comes to us. So this is not exclusive. Life in Christ is not a guarantee that things are going to be easy or that we're going to have a life that's full of health and wealth and comfort and easy going church Sundays. That's not the way this thing works. The whole world came to a pause these last year, this last year and a half just to recognize that we really are not on some trajectory toward some perfect form of health. We may never have that kind of security, even in our own country, in the years to come. We might have to put up with whatever the next thing is. And you know, last night it was reported in England that there were two cases of yet a brand new variant to the COVID vaccine. I mean, to the COVID-19, COVID which now we should call COVID-21. But... Um, but, you know, the two new variant, uh, this variant that came along, sorry, let me get this right. There were two people that came down with a new variant that's beyond Delta. And apparently it's highly contagious. And they were able to catch that fast enough to be able to quarantine them. But we're, we're not done with this. And we're never going to be done with things that don't go the way that we want them to. So what could our response be? The reason that Mary's story is singled out in Luke is to make sure that we remember there were faithful people who were stepping up to do the right thing, and this one happened to be about 13 years old. See, even back then, there was an age of ascension, so to speak, or uh, an aging up into adulthood. For a girl, it was actually at the age of 12, and we don't know a lot about the details of Mary before she is visited by the angel Gabriel, but we know where she came from, Nazareth, which was a little tiny town, a little tiny town. Hmm. Let me go back, because we're not to that point yet. <laughs> there we go. And, and as she's in this little town of Nazareth, which, by the way, the population of Nazareth at this time was probably around 100 people. It was an insignificant little town that was just off the King's Highway. If you look at a map of Israel in the back of your Bible, you'll find there this little dotted line called the King's Highway. And all that meant was that that was the easiest path to take if you were walking, which, by the way, everybody did. And it was also the place you could find water on regular stops. Just like California was laid out. Every city that we have in California centered around a water source. In fact, every city that's ever been formed in the world was formed around a well or a river or a stream. 
all of our United Methodist churches were laid out based on how far a circuit rider could make it on horse from one place to the next before they could find water for their animal and for themselves. And there's where the populations would start to form. So as I was pastor uh, DS, district superintendent to the North District, that includes places like Lone Pine, and Big Pine, Independence, then Big Pine, and then Bishop. And the, they were exactly one day's ride apart. And that's where the wells were. So this was a place for them to have uh, a life. And this was a place where they could farm or grow orchards. And they, this was a place also for the church to be. Well, there's no different in these days, except that Bethlehem was kind of one-off. So it had a water source, but it wasn't a very popular place. And in fact, she was most likely a peasant girl. And we're guessing she was probably 12 to 13 years of age. The angel Gabriel shows up. There's a whole study we could do just on which angel goes where. It's a lot of fun to know how God called out the angels. Apparently, Gabriel was the cleanup batter. So he came when there was big news. There were a few other angels that did other stuff, apparently. But, you know, angel literally means messenger. So the messenger to Mary was unique in that Gabriel was the one who uh, has been attributed over time to trumpets, to, to big fanfare, kind of a, you know, not a, not a Mary, did you know, beautiful, soft, sort of, hey, he didn't just sort of probably slide in. As, angels aren't he or she anyway, but, you know, didn't slide into the room and say, hey, Mary, I got some, got some stuff that's going to happen in your life. No, this was like a big deal. And as Mary is having this conversation, the angel, do not be afraid. Like, that's going to work, right? Do you, have, do you know any 13-year-old girls, by the way? Anybody? It's calm, collected, soothing, and, hey, tell me whatever's going to happen next. I'm, I'm in for it. Yeah, sure, Mom, sure, Dad, whatever, whatever, yeah. Now, I haven't raised any girls, but I have some granddaughters, and I see a precursor to 13, and I'm telling you, it's a different deal. And so here's Mary hearing God's message to her with very specific kind of instructions, right? Being told that there's going to be something going on in your life, and although Mary didn't volunteer for this duty, she is listening. She's listening intently enough to know that when there's going to be these words, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and his name will be Jesus, and he will be great. In fact, so great that he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give you him the throne, his ancestor David. Now, Mary knew enough about Scripture, apparently, to that anybody who's going to come and take the King David's place is going to be somebody who would be then prophesied back in Isaiah, that unto you a child shall be born, and he will come from a virgin. So Mary's response here, how is this going to be possible when I am a virgin? Now, this doesn't mean that this she's proclaiming that I have not yet had sexual relationships. This means that I'm already betrothed. I'm already married to somebody named Joseph. So betrothal in those days, you might understand this. You might already know all this, but let me just repeat it for the rest of us. Betrothals meant you were married in an arrangement on the day that the betrothal is announced. You are technically married, but you are not allowed to consummate that marriage until a year later. And then that year period of time, your husband-to-be or your actual husband, because marriage starts at the beginning of the arrangement, not at some sort of celebration after the year is over. So Joseph is already betrothed to her, and Joseph may or may not have been from Bethlehem. I mean, we know, we know his family was from Bethlehem, but he certainly wasn't up there in Nazareth. And I've been saying Bethlehem this whole time, and I've been talking about Nazareth. Wow. No, it's not that. But I've had two granddaughters in my house for four days, and I have had no sleep. So this is... And those angels, by the way, belong to my son, Nick, who's here in the room with us today. And those angels up there, Indiana and, and um, Athena, are up there uh, being cared for. So, so can we start the whole service over again? 
now. All right. You got that Bethlehem I'm talking about is Nazareth. You know that Nazareth is only about a 10-minute walk from this huge city at the time, a city that had so many people, Sepphoris. Sepphoris had a population of 30,000 people. That was the cultural center of what would happen on the King's Highway at this point. That's where you would, as a traveler, get all your services. Bethlehem, down where we know that Joseph comes from, has no real connection to Nazareth, where she has come from. If you visit Nazareth today, they'll show you where the town of 100 people sort of centrally located. And that there's also a cave that's been dedicated to where Mary lived because most of the people in this little village was actually on the side of a hill and it was carved out of limestone. They found that most of the homes that have been excavated actually go down into the ground and they weren't above the surface dwellings. So it was probably a cave. It was probably a peasant's life. And it certainly was not anywhere to have the Son of God start from. So she's saying... I am already betrothed to another person. How could I even be a virgin in delivering this son of God even if my marriage had been consummated? I'm the wrong person. And basically Mary's trying to explain in her responses that the angel Gabriel might have just got the wrong address, you know? <laughs> she might have suggested a few friends of hers that live, you know, that are better suited for this. But what's most interesting is the way she ends up after all this news comes to her. Mary just says this, here I am. Now, if you go back to the calling of the prophets, which she probably knew some of these words and some of these call stories. If you look at the prophet Isaiah and how he was called, the prophet Jeremiah, how he was called. Moses, who was like, no, oh, not me. He definitely had other suggestions of who you should take in. You're visiting the wrong person, burning bush. You should be over there talking to my brother Aaron. He speaks really well. I don't. So, but Mary states the very clear message. Here I am. I guess it's me. But I'm, I'm in. In fact, she goes on to say, not only here I am, but I am the servant of the Lord. So whatever you're asking me, Lord, through this angel, okay. And then finally, let it be with me according to your word. Now in here are echoes of Jesus. This is mom giving sort of a preview of what Jesus is going to say eventually in his life and his mission. Maybe already she's been inspired by this unborn child that is yet to come. She's already setting up for him. And I imagine when Jesus is five years old and throwing some kind of tantrum. I don't know if Jesus did or not, but he was probably a normal boy. And he probably had all kinds of moments in his life. And I'm sure Jesus had to be taught. And so Mary and Joseph, Mary being an influence on his life, would say things like, you know, I did not exactly sign up to have you in the first place. <laughs> if only you knew how this was not the way it was supposed to be. Jesus first born in that family. We know in scripture that he had a, at least two brothers and maybe a sister as well. Uh, some scripture, some versions of the Bible don't include that because that would bring up all kinds of questions about could she still be a virgin Mary after all of that happened. So see, this, is, this is where the controversy about this immaculate conception comes about. I know that theologians still argue about whether or not she was truly a virgin when she was born, whether this was even possible for God. And I laugh when I hear a theologian say, maybe that wasn't possible for God. And I'm thinking, truly, if you spent your whole life studying God, you might have put together now that what you think is possible is not God's agenda. Amen? And your opinion, no matter how many times you Wikipedia it, is not going to change the fact <laughs> that God might know more. So Mary's threefold response, I think, is kind of the key here for us. She says, basically, 
here I am. It could have been, here I am. <laughs> or, here I am, and why pick me? But it doesn't matter. She names it, here I am. Now, in Hebrew, in Aramaic, in Greek, it doesn't get any softer than this. In fact, it gets a little more firm. Because for a person to make an individual statement like this, to single themselves out as somebody who's being asked to do something miraculous by God, was so countercultural from the way people lived in this time and age and location. You always identified yourself by your family. And you always identified your family by the village you lived in. So becoming a part of something great would have meant that her whole family would have been a part of something great. That everybody in her village would be honored by this if the angel Gabriel came to her village and said, one of you is going to deliver the Son of God. Do you understand the difference here between the Western individual kind of living we do, the kind of myopic view we have of the world and the way we still think that the world spins around us, as we talked about last week, sort of being the center of it all? This was not common practice for faithful Jews. You did not single yourself out. You did not call yourself out above other people. You lived in the community that needed you most. So here I am means that Mary understands that she is now going to have to leave her family. Her family would have perfect rights to stone her to death the moment she announced that she was pregnant in the betrothal, not waiting till the age or time of her marriage to be completed. So this is not a flippant thing. This is a statement of, okay, here I am. Now this makes sense, right? I am a servant of the Lord. So no matter what this is going to mean to me or my family, however they're going to be disgraced, basically whether I live or die through this ordeal, and then may it be word, your word or be according to your word. May it happen the way that you are professing this to me. It's not that she was young. 13-year-old girls in these days were getting married, having children. We think about that today. It's like, wow, why would God do that? Why would there be a whole culture centered around that? Why would the husband be 10 or 20 years older than the woman that he was, girl he was marrying? I, I don't quite understand it. I wouldn't pretend to even make an opinion about that. I just know that Joseph was, probably was older. Apparently he wasn't originally from Bethlehem. So as we're kind of listening in today, and I, I would love to ask each of you that are online, Pam and Christine, and Charlene, Judy, Donna, Roseanne, and Christy, you know, to, to respond to us today on Facebook. Just let us know some of your thoughts about this amazing thing that was happening to this person named Mary. No wonder Catholicism focused in on Mary because she was a whole lot clearer to understand in her faithfulness to God. Jesus, way too controversial. In fact, in the days in which they were trying to position the proper people in front of the church in Rome and in other parts of Catholicism, they, they were focusing on something, someone that would be someone they could honor, they could hail Mary, but it was really tough to figure out who Jesus is. So therefore, in Catholicism, the idea was let's take Jesus back when he wasn't so controversial. So he was a child and Mary was the adult. And that's why in most churches in Roman Catholicism, Mary's the adult holding the baby Jesus. When we see Jesus as an adult, he is in the crucifixion. So there is this idea of picking the one who was most faithful. And this is where Mary continues to be for us. I spent a little bit of time kind of praying about this. Who would be someone who I have known that has had this kind of faith? Who really would say, here I am, 
regardless of what you're asking me to do, and this is how we're going to go about it, Lord. So I wanted to share with you about somebody that I've been honored to know and still keep in touch with on occasion. I've mentioned him in an earlier sermon, but Bishop Gabriel Unda was elected in 2012 by the General Church to actually organize a brand new place of the United Methodist Church existence, a conference, actually, an entire conference in the Eastern Congo, which today we would know this, by the way, as the Republic, the Dominican Republic of Congo. Now, this map happens to be a modern map of this area, and everything that is in yellow and orange is, in fact, part of the Eastern Congo Conference. If you were to put this on scale with the United States right now, this line over here uh, that separates the Congo from the Republic of the Congo, that would basically be the Mississippi. And everything that's over to the east to Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, those would all be the east coast adding another two or 300 miles to the coast. And that would run basically from up in, uh, you know, New Hampshire and Vermont and all those areas down to Florida. So it's basically the size of the eastern United States, roughly. That's how big the area was. And if you know anything about the history of the immigrants that came across in the crisis in Rwanda and all those crises that have happened since in different warring factions and governments, not a lot of help from Angola or Zambia, the Congo or some of the places to the north, including the southern Sudan, which is still one of the poorest areas in the world. Imagine coming in and becoming bishop of this, establishing United Methodist churches, sending pastors out into the jungles and into the valleys and into the rivers. You basically, there's not a lot of transportation infrastructure here. In fact, when he visited the United States to try to get some support for the ministry that they were doing, the one thing he said we needed is we need motorcycles because it's the only way for our pastors to go into other towns to get supplies and medicine, food, and bring it back to the villages. And it was the only way for he as bishop to be able to visit these places. So I heard need Christian medical food motorcycle, and I said, count us in. <laughs> so six years ago, we started to raise money to buy motorcycles for Bishop Unda. And we asked at every charge conference for people to bring their offering in. And it only took us about two months and we raised all the money we need for two of these motorcycles. And they got so much money after that fact because we started to talk about this that he bought one motorcycle and th for him and then he bought a, a van, a 12 passenger van uh, in addition, so that he could put people in that van and then drive them. Look at the distance here. He was driving them from them all the way out to either South Africa or north up into Egypt so that they could take people back and forth to the hospitals to get care. In the meantime, malaria killed his wife, killed his oldest daughter. He has seven surviving children of his own. I think one of his children have married. I met him. He's a pastor. He's a young man who's coming up in the church as a leader in this particular area. He was just reelected once again to this area to serve another four years. And in the meantime, with all this devastation in his own family, the place that he has centered his ministry is known as the rape capital of the world. So understand that if malaria did not drive a young woman out of the village, it would be the abuse of women that would take him out, or her out, I'm sorry. The statistics, I, I'm not going to go too deep into this because honestly this is not a PG or PG-13 thing to talk about. But know that in most of these villages, there's a rape every 48 minutes. 
And most of the women who are birthing their children are doing that in the jungle, trying to protect them from malaria and bad water. But they basically have sent the girls off because if it's not happening within their home, it's happening within their family structure. And so they have been sent off into the Congo to live in jungles. Now what's happening is that there's a reemergence. When the rebels pass through a village and strip it clean and abuse the people in it and steal the young boys off to serve in their own armies, then there would be basically nothing left. So in honor of his wife, we started to raise money now not for motorcycles and buses. That wasn't enough. It was to raise the money for the Mama Lin Center, which, by the way, in Kindu, which is located right here. I wish you could see all this, but you can look this up later. And we built the Mama Lin Center that could house these young women who were coming back out of the jungle with their children to educate them, to give them basic instruction on how to reintegrate themselves into the culture and also to give visitation rights for the men in the life that have abused them, that they could come and get their own training so that they could reunite families. The Mama Lin Center opened about three years ago. It only holds about 60 to 90 women and they're only able to stay for so many months because there's so many who are coming out of the jungles back into this place that they need to have the bed space. If you want to support this, this ministry and mission is still going on, and there's ways for me to direct you to that, but the abuse of young people and asking them to do impossible things, and it's not coming from God as, hey, I'd like you to do this because this will be what we need to do to go forward, but there are still 13-year-old girls that are saving the world. He's not my hero because he stands in the way of such things at the great risk and sacrifice of his own family. He's my hero because he has continued to be faithful to Jesus Christ in the midst of tragedy, in the hardship of running an entire half of a nation, basically, and trying to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to those who need to hear it the most. He set up a coalition to start to work with the tribe called the Pygmies. Now we've made lots of jokes about these folks over the years. But there's never been a more inspirational group of aboriginal kinds of folks in, in my you know, way of thinking about it as the Pygmies who are now not only starting to understand that there is good news for them, that, that there's also medical supplies available to them. There, there's education that's available to their children. It takes a person of faith to do these things. It takes somebody who's willing to say, here I am. Send me. I am a servant of the Lord. And whatever your word says, However you want to use me, that is how we will go forward. So it comes back to us, I really think. Mary's journey, Bishop Unda's journey, it's our journey. We're asked every day in some small way, I think, are we available for God to use? Is the amazing thing that could happen in your family, is it you? If you have family that doesn't live here in this country, but you're still connected to people, there are some places else, you know, are you, the, are you the peacemaker? Are you the one that brings not just pie, but you bring a piece of yourself? You, you bring a word of hope. You are that candle in your family. And, and are we willing, as difficult as our tasks might be at times, are we willing to truly follow God's will and word for us as we move through these difficult things? That's really the story of Advent. In a violent world that still is a violent world, in a world that's full of poverty and peasantry, 
in a world in which we still do not have a, an understanding on how to care for each other in such ways that we build each other up. But we still seem to find ways and reasons to not like some people. Are we willing to say, here I am. I will be the one who speaks out on your behalf. I will be the one to care and love for you or for yours. That's Christmas. I know we love Christmas to just be this. And it's beautiful. And it brings us some hope. But it brings us some hope because this is an evergreen. It was designed to be the symbol that Jesus lives forever. And so can we with our faith in him. That's the only reason we have these inside our houses and decorating them and paying hundreds of dollars to buy one. This one uh, is pretty hardy. Apparently it's been around here a while. So... uh, It's an ever, evergreen, and the lights are included. So, In fact, we need to find one of these for our own house. Uh, uh, we, we wanted to go fresh tree this year, so maybe we'll go out there to the farm and, and bring one in. But in truth, it's only a celebration when we know why it is we celebrate and who we celebrate. Now, having said all that, I have good friends, and we have a whole community that we live in where there are a lot of Jewish people. So I want to say Happy Hanukkah to you as well. I know it started early this year. And I also know that there is great sacrifice that has been made by the Jewish religion as well in order for Christianity to even exist. Let's not forget that Jesus was a Jew who loved the world so much that he gave his only life so that we would have faith in him. I wish I had some cute little story to end on here, but I'm just going to hold us in this part of anticipation because there's another person we're going to talk about next week who had not equally a difficult journey, but somebody who actually had a choice in the matter and decided to be Jesus' stepdad. Let me pray for us. We come here today, Lord, identifying that life and death happens all the time in our world and in our families to the ones who are closest to us. And we know, Lord, that we most identify with those who have had lives of success or things that have worked out. But, Lord, you chose the least to deliver the most. You chose Mary to bring Jesus born into this world, son of God, son of man. What a miracle that was that she was willing and open to say, here I am, a servant of the Lord. Let it be in me according to your word. May that be our prayer today. May that be our inspiration today. May that be the way in which we love and care for each other. For we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Please pray with me. Father, we lift up our praise to you, our needs to you, because you've said we can always come to you. So this morning, we give thanks for being able to be here in freedom to pray. We lift up the Palmdale First UMC and Noah Wood UMC in Granada Hills and know that as we pray, We pray together and that you hear us. We ask you to be with Marv and Judy's family because we rejoice she's home with you, but yet we're sad because we miss her. We ask you to be with those with health issues, Lord. Many of us are struggling. We also ask that you be with those who are in recovery There's been a lot of surgeries going on as hospitals have opened up and become available. And we ask you to be with many of those who are in recovery. 
We also ask for you to be beside those suffering from dementia and in nursing care homes. Please bless their caregivers, bless them as they move closer to you, Lord. We also lift up those in hospice who feel you nearby and know that you're with them. We continue to pray for those in cancer treatment, Lord. We are encouraged by those who have gained strength and recovery, and we pray for that for our other friends and family. And most of all, Lord, may we hear the message today that we don't know your plans, but you do. And we pray that we have the faith to just trust that you will guide us where you need us to be. Please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At this time in the service, we like to think about the blessings we've received, and we invite you to give back some of the blessings to God. This Tuesday in the secular world, it's called Giving Tuesday. It's kind of the end of the year, and people can write off what they want to donate to and feel good about, oh, you know, I can give Tuesday, yay. But as Christians, we're called every week to think about our blessings, which are also tax deductible, by the way. And we can give back as we are called or feel or moved in our hearts to give back. So at this time, let's do that.
Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for the blessings you've given us. Thank you for the talents you've blessed us with. And we just hope that you take these offerings and use them to go forth into your world. Amen. Our closing hymn today is I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. It's a little different in terms of the way this thing rolls, and it kind of rolls. So uh, I'm going to help sing up here while we share this. Oh, thank you very much. And um, we'll sing this along together. All the words don't fit on one note, so that's why we do this. All right, here we go. I want to walk as a child of the light. I want to follow Jesus. God sent the stars to give light to the world. The star in my life is Jesus. In him there is no darkness at all. The night and the day are both alike. The Lamb is the light of the city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. I want to be the brightness of God. I want to look at Jesus. Clear Son of Righteousness, thine on my path and show me the way to the Father. In him there is no darkness at all. The night and the day are both alike. The Lamb is the light of the city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. I'm looking for the coming of Christ. I want to know, oh Jesus. When we have run with patience the race, we shall know the joy of Jesus. In him there is no darkness at all. The night and the day are both alike. The Lamb is the light of the city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. Well, Lord God, that is our prayer today, that we would be able to follow you, no matter where it leads, no matter what kind of choices we have to make in our own life, no matter how our family will or will not receive the ways we live because of our faithfulness to you, May us never turn aside or be ashamed of you. Let us never be humiliated by the things we do on your behalf, for we know it is in that place we find peace and life and life everlasting. Go with us this day into this day. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, Pastor. How are you? I'm good. I think yeah, there's good. a mic that over here. great. Oh, thank you. I just want to say it. Oh, thank, thank you. you. All right. How great is it? I'm just very, very thankful that Gabriel got lost. Gives a new meaning to Hail Mary. And I did Google it. I know you're going to make fun of me, but it is a two-hour drive between Bethlehem and Nazareth. Two-hour drive. Eight hours by donkey. So there you go. Okay. So coming up, if you need a fresh evergreen, I know the Newbury Park High School baseball team started selling their fresh evergreens just on the corner of Michael and Wendy, right? No, Borchard and Michael. I don't know. I only worked it for four years, right, Scotty? <laughs> yes, he's very thankful that he's not driving Christmas trees this year, but a little sad that he has to go back to St. Louis today. Right by the library, right. You can find it there. So uh, lots of fresh Christmas trees if you need an evergreen. Um, coming up, the men's breakfast on December 4th at Denny's, 8 a.m., bright and early, those guys meet. And on the 5th, you have until the 5th to volunteer for the community Christmas shop. The uh, 5th is also your open house. Yeah, that's between 3 and 6. That's going to be fun. 
Got to stop by and uh, check that out. On the 11th is the women's breakfast at 8.30. Where's that going to be, Kathy? To be determined. To be determined. Just go like this, and she'll tell you where to show up. <laughs> Just show up. Eat with your fork. On the 12th uh, is the children's Christmas worship service, and the angels are performing. So December 12th, mark your calendar, be here. It's going to be very fun to see them back after two years off. Uh, Christmas in the worship will be on the 19th, our Christmas worship service with the choir. And the 24th is our Christmas Eve worship service at 7 p.m. Thank you for the altar flowers. Those are beautiful from Ron and Janice. We're still looking for people to help with flowers, right, Marsha? Yes, we are. And she is help, happy to mentor you and teach you how to do it. What? Oh, Kyle and Jacqueline got married. Oh, congratulations, Nancy. I can't believe that's Kyle. Oh, my gosh. What? He wasn't going to stay 13 forever, I guess. Okay. That is such awesome news. How lovely. We have a girl in the family. Fantastic. Um, and happy birthday. Happiest birthday on the 29th to Ben and Bob Bieri and Jennifer Winter. Barbara Carfless. Happy birthday, Barbara. On the 4th, Katie Rainey and Holden Shepard. Happiest birthday. Are we going to sing happy birthday today? St. Matthew's Church family, welcome home. Oh, we have another announcement. Yes, we do. <laughs> oh, surprising. Hello. Um, on behalf of the SPRC, we want to announce, it's sad, but it's good for her, that Cassidy Dyer, who's been our nursery attendant for the last um, probably t over two years, about a, a little over a year and a half before the, but we were shut down, and she's been has, has returned since September of this year. But um, this will be her last Sunday, so she's in there right now watching Pastor Jim's grandkids. And if you happen to see her after the service, just wish her well and, and give her a thank you for all that she's done for our kids at St. Matthews. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great Sunday, and we'll see you in church.